Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on another episode of our Irish Country Life here in the west coast of Ireland. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Nikolai, and together with this little man, Scooter, and Chris, who's my film crew for today, we'd like to welcome you into the library here in the house. So today I'm going to give you a little tour of the library, and I'm going to speak about some of the items in the library. I'm sitting here on a summer's day in my velvet smoking jacket with the wood-burning stove fired up and some lovely local turf burning, which smells wonderful. And I'm going to enjoy for now a lovely cup of tea and a piece of homemade Bakewell tart. And I do hope that you'll excuse me whilst I enjoy this and come back and I will take you on a little tour of this room. See you soon. So everyone, tea break and cake has now finished and it's time to get on with some work for you guys. So, as I said, this is the library. This was, when we first moved in, this was the butler's bedroom. As he was a man of great age, he had to move from upstairs where he used to sleep in the old Ireland room, which we will show you on another tour. He had to move downstairs, so the library became his bedroom. And I remember this room had a dark red color on the walls, and there was also a bed in this corner here. So this is where he slept. The Baroness still slept upstairs. So we got rid of the red and we wanted it to be a beautiful racing green. And that's the color you see on the walls today. Just would like to let everybody know, because it's a question that many people when they visit the house ask me, was everything in the house when we bought it? There was absolutely nothing here when we bought the house. The house was a complete shell. Everything you see, is a collection of mine and Chris's over the last 30 years that we've been together. We both have a great passion for antiques and lovely paintings and beautiful interiors. And so that's where it all came from. Each item is st strategically placed and has its own place. And I like to keep everything in the house clean, as I think that's very important when you have antiques, is not to just let the dust gather and spoil the look of the room. So I will talk to you a little bit about what's going on in here. And the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the fireplace. The beautiful fireplace is original to the room. The only difference with the fireplace is it did have a dog basket inside. But I felt that because the opening was so large that most of the heat was going up the chimney. So I decided a couple of years ago, would it harm the look of the room if I was to insert a stove. So actually I went for an enamel stove and I think it looks perfect in there and I hope that you would agree. And actually it makes a very big difference to keeping the room warm. This room is now lovely and cosy and snug as it should be. 
as I burn the local turf, which I will show you, and it smells wonderful. And there is a sod of local turf, and it literally comes from a few miles up the road on the bog at the five crossroads. Next year, me and Scooter are going to go and dig our own bog up there. And so that should be a lot of fun. Never done it. It's hard work, but we'll see how we get on. So we should have our own turf next year to burn, as opposed to buying it. In this alcove here, there wasn't anything originally here, and we wanted to call this the library, so obviously we needed to have books. So the room is not huge, so we couldn't have freestanding bookshelves. So I came up with the idea that I had a while back bought a little um, schoolhouse, a parochial hall up in Northern Ireland, and one of the items that was left in that derelict building was the church organ, and the top of the organ where the sheets of music used to sit. So I removed it from there because I thought somebody would take it. And I stored it in the coach house for many years, thinking one day I'll use it in the garden and I'll do something with it. And then I had a brainwave that I could cut it and I could make it part of these lovely bookshelves that are here now. And basically, I just put some brackets on the wall. I bought some timber from the local timber merchant. I stained it, the walnut color that we have on the floor, the satin walnut. And then I bought some uh, church evangelical ribbon to go around the outside. Chris will show you all of that in more detail as he goes in to the bookcase. So we filled it with lots of lovely antiquarian books and we have a lovely stuffed parrot in a box below. The books overlook Scooter when he's snoring away in bed. I don't know if you can hear him, but he's really cozy now with the fire going and he's enjoying an afternoon nap. Cake is finished, so he's decided to have a little sleep. Gracing the windows in the library, again, we have some beautiful gold panels from Sussex House English Home. And we also have some interesting tiebacks here, which were um, a priest's maniple point. And I got a load of them off eBay and decided one day, what was I going to do with them? And then I had a brainwave and I thought, I know, I'll take them to the dressmaker and we'll have them made into curtain tiebacks. So we have several of these around the house. Also in the windows are the original shutters, which all still work in perfect order. And we do close these in the winter because you, it really, really makes a big difference to keeping the heat in the room. And they are really, really exquisite. I'd like to draw your attention to the lovely pelmets above the curtains. These are made by myself. Um, a few years ago, I set about making something for over the windows to hide the pole that the curtains need to run on. And so I made these uh, box pelmets and installed them and Chris gilded them for me. Here we have a portrait painting of Thomas Orr, son of William of Inishannon in County Cork, painted by William Hissingbottom. Underneath that painting, we have a lovely Queen Anne sofa with the two armchairs, which we purchased locally a long time ago from a antique store in Sligo. As we didn't have the internet back then, it was very difficult. So we had to shop local and we had to buy from what was available to us. It's a lovely Queen Anne style sofa with lovely inlay. To the left of that, we have a lovely horse painting of a man going out to do the hunt. In the background, you can see the fox and the horse's name is Handsome. We have a revolving bookcase below that, and we also have some lovely music books by Chopin, a collection of Chopin's music books in there. So here we have a chess set, a beautiful mother of pearl inlaid chess set with all hand painted individual pieces. And I'll just show you one. It's Scooter's favorite, favorite thing to play in the library. He's a very sore loser, and he often gets very frustrated whilst losing to whoever his component is. Okay, so this wall here we've kept for our beautiful horse painting collection. Um, once upon a time, a few years ago, I did find a lovely horse painting in a gallery in the Cotswolds, but unfortunately somebody beat me to it and I lost the painting. It was stunning. It was of a beautiful horse in all its armor ready for battle with gold leaf and it was really, really a lovely painting. That vision has never left my head, but maybe one day. So we have our horse paintings along here. We also have some taxidermy, an owl and a exotic bird. And then we have our credenza, which houses our bar. So very often when we have a guest come who fancies a tipple of whiskey, we'll give them 
uh, a nice Irish whiskey or an Irish Baileys served from the bar. On top of the credenza, we have some lovely blue and white collection. And then over here to my left, we have Chris's favorite painting, which is of a stabled horse. Um, I remember buying this in a gallery in Suffolk when we lived in Suffolk uh, a few years ago. And above the horse painting is our uh, taxidermy stag's head. Below we have our lovely silk pleated genie lamp and um, stunning handmade silk shade. And we have some antiquarian books and some busts. Below that again, we have a lovely saddle which has been in the family for a long time and it belonged to one of our very first ever horses and our riding cap. I come from a family that always loved horses and we used to ride as children. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our tour of the library. I hope you've enjoyed it, but don't go away because I'm going to treat you and make some lovely homemade Irish soda bread. Again, a very, very simple recipe and an absolutely very tasty bread to have either on its own or toasted with a little bit of Irish butter and lovely homemade jam. Really lovely. So I'll go and I'll change into something a little bit more casual and we'll get on with making some lovely brown Irish soda bread. So see you in a moment. Scooter is sitting over his game of chess. He's on the last move and he's terrified he's going to lose all his chips. Each of these chips amount to one chicken's hand which he is devastated about. So he has been in this bed for the last hour deliberating over whether he's going to make this move or not. Are you going to make this move, Scooter? Are you frightened of the chicken's hand? Is it going to work? Are you going to win? Hmm. So you guys, welcome back. And now I'm going to make that lovely traditional Irish soda bread that I spoke about earlier. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a recipe for two loaf pans of bread. And then if you want to just make one, you literally just half the recipe that I'm going to give you. So all I've done is literally lined each tin with a strip of greaseproof paper. And that just helps with getting the bread out of the tin when it's cooked. So, first of all, the first ingredient for this bread is buttermilk. Now I understand people can't just get access to buttermilk like that and it's not something that you keep in your fridge. So there's a very simple way of making something as close to it as possible and that is we have 900 millilitres of normal full fat milk. Into that 900 millilitres to make it buttermilk we're going to add six tablespoons of distilled white vinegar. Okay? So six tablespoons of distilled white vinegar just into your milk. And that will help turn the normal full fat milk into buttermilk if you leave it to stand for about five minutes. So get that ready before you start weighing out your other ingredients. Also into this mixture, I have put two eggs. I have put four tablespoons of runny honey and I have put four tablespoons of olive oil. That's all your liquids in that bowl there and you just give it a mix together. Then, in our separate bowl, we have our dry ingredients. We have 300 grams of bread flour, or you can use plain flour, whichever you've got in the store cupboard. Then into that, I'm going to add 600 grams of wholemeal flour. So I'm just going to get my scales on right, and I'm going to add my 600 grams. And that's my 600 grams of whole milk flour. Okay, I've sieved the other flour and now I'm going to sieve the whole milk flour. But before I do that, I need one and a half teaspoons of salt. One and a half. I also need two teaspoons of bicarbonate of soda. One, two. And I also need two teaspoons of baking powder. Two. And those will all get sieved together with the flour. So your whole new flour will sieve and then you'll get left with some of the coarse grains in the sieve. You can just tip them into the bowl. Nothing wrong with that. Once all your dry ingredients are mixed together in the bowl, make a well in the centre and then add in your liquid. So. 
all of your liquid, you can just pour it all in together, all at once. And then just mix with your spatula or your wooden spoon, whatever is your preference. Now, your mix will be quite runny, which is perfectly normal. And just stir it until you incorporate all the dry ingredients and there's no lumps of flour visible to your eye. Although I always find there's always one sitting lurking at the bottom of the bowl, which halfway through pouring you have to <laughs> then try and mix while it's up in the air so as not to get a dry lump in your loaf of bread. Okay, so that's now all incorporated. I think there should be no dry lumps at the bottom of the bowl. And we're going to literally split this mixture into our two pans because as I said from the beginning, we're making two. And if you want just one, just literally half the recipe. Okay. So we'll kind of gauge what we think to be half. And then we'll go again. And it doesn't matter if one is slightly more than the other one because it's for us. Okay, then to finish this bread off, you have a couple of options that I use. One is I like to use a little mix of seeds. So I have some different seeds, which I like to use. I literally just put a couple of spoonfuls of them over the top. So we have a mix of sunflower seeds, etc. So any kind of seeds that you can get your hands on. If you haven't got any seeds at home and you still want to make this bread, what's very nice also is some porridge oats if you've got some of them lying around. But I find the seeds are really wonderful when the bread is toasted, you get that lovely nutty flavor of the, of the seeds. I've probably put too many, but anyway, we like, we like seeds. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put this bread into the aga, or if you're cooking it at home, I would like you to put it into a 220 degree fan oven for 10 minutes. After the 10 minutes, then turn the oven down to 180. What you will find happen is you'll find the middle of the bread rises up with that intense heat to begin with and gives it a lovely rise in the middle and it looks really yummy. It happened to me by pure accident and I've stuck with it ever since because it really does look wonderful. So for now I'm going to pop this into the aga and turn the, crank the aga up full and then after 10 minutes I'll turn it down to its normal setting and 45 minutes in the oven should see you with a beautiful lovely loaf of bread. So our 40 minutes is up and we're now going to take our bread out of the aga. Okay. And just be careful because it's very hot. Okay, and we're going to pop it onto our wire rack just to leave it in the tin for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then we will score around the edge with our plain knife and loosen our bread and then it's ready for it to come out. And there you have delicious homemade Irish brown soda bread. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification button so that you can get notified of our next video. Until next time, from Nikolai, Scooter and Chris, take care and see you soon. Bye-bye.